while we wait for our AV personnel. By AV, I mean little name tent. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to stand up. <laughs> so, hi, my name is Sumana Harihadeshwara, and I am the moderator and creator of the Imaginary Book Club. Thank you all for coming. Yay. Wow, that was like a soft yet pleasant view. Yeah. <laughs> Two kind, of, two or three inspirations for this panel. One is the Goodreads panels that you've heard about happening at other cons, where basically everyone reads the same five books and then they just sort of review them. Oh, I gave my review, and then we all talk about it. Another was the Stanislaw Lem anthology, A Perfect Vacuum, which is an anthology of book reviews of imaginary books <laughs> that Stanislaw Lem just came up with. And another is that at Wiscon, my first Wiscon, Ellen Kushner helped me get clothes at the clothing spa. And then Julia saw the fabric of it, and we were like, is it black, is it gray? And she said, your velour top is color velour, or material velour, color uncertain. Should we call that color Ellen Kushner gray? <laughs> <laughs> My immediate response was to come up with this blur. Many works of speculative fiction shift raiments to the background of the story. Few put these crucial elements of world building where they should be, center stage. What clothes will wear us as we change our politics, our culture, our technology, and our way of life? What will be the fabric of our brave new lives? John Joseph Adams presents a new anthology, Material Velour, Color Unknown. <laughs> What's inside that magic wardrobe? <laughs> and therefore, I came up with the idea of this uh, imaginary book club. Each of us has come up with an imaginary book that we will present a review of, and then the rest of us will discuss it. At briefly, unfortunately, because there are five of us and because we've lost eight minutes. But uh, we don't know what each other's books are, other than them knowing this about me. So I'm going to be very surprised to find out what the four of these have come up with. Um, so our four people here are Richard Jenick, Liza Furr, Ellen Clagius, and Ben Rosenbaum. But instead of letting you introduce yourselves, I'm just going to steamroller you now to get on with the review of... I will be very flat. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a two of the two. Exactly. Um, so Material Galore, Color Unknown, has a lot of great stories in it. Um, I think it's a pretty well-balanced anthology because you get, you know, some more sci-fi cyberpunk stuff like Bruce Sterling's Joseph and the Amazing Techno-Deterministic Dreamcoat. <laughs> um, but you also get stuff that's more of like a magical realist vein. For example, you get Marianne Mohanraj's The Red Sari which explores the issue of why on every single book of magical realism <laughs> by an author like her, you see a red sari on the cover. Um, and in her view, it has to do with the relationship between the reader, sex, and uh, Indian American literature. So it ends with a plug for her nonprofit, which is a little odd, but you know, it's beneficial. Um, I, I really liked Joe Walton's story in it, but it was kind of weird that everything in it was blue. <laughs> and then um, Ellen Kushner had a story that was great, but the color was kind of hard to categorize. <laughs> um, I really like, I, and again, you get like a, a real diversity of kinds of stories in here. Like uh, there was this one story by Tempest, or was it by Spocky Monster, or Kendra Gill? <laughs> um, uh, anyway, um, I, okay, actually, there was a really great story called Quilting the Other by D.C. Shaw, <laughs> uh, in which it was really more of a how-to, that in order to be like Nisi Shaw, you have to quilt a Nisi Shaw. <laughs> uh, and I, I really appreciated that forthrightness in this, you know, and we are living in a science fictional age, and um, you also got that sense from Ted Chang's The Life Cycle of Software Objects, <laughs> Which was both about a loom and also the structure of the story was like a loom. Uh, yeah, it was kind of. But I mean, obviously, the uh, there were some real high-powered people also in this anthology that you wouldn't have thought Adams could have gotten. But you know, he has a reputation like this now. Like um, he got some photos in a sort of interstitial way from Ellen Clagius of some portable child hoods. <laughs> um, you had Cat Valente's redress, which unfortunately was kind of a retread of Palimpsest. This dress just remade itself for each wearer. And if you ask me, it was kind of like Sisterhood of the Traveling A-Line. <laughs> 
Um, and the, uh, honestly, like the thing that most people are going to buy this for is Neil Stephenson's High Fiber, which is about a fiber optic cable where these traveling geek knitting women uh, take the, the strands and, and turn them into these sort of cyber head pieces. It's written, uh, the women are so unrealistic in this one, just like all of Neil Stephenson. Um, uh, but you know, the thing that we at WizCon are going to love it most for is Joanna Truss's When She Changed. <laughs> Which I won't spoil, I'll just let you read for yourself. So, um, just just briefly, I was wondering, uh, since the rest of you also read this book, um, just in the next few minutes, we'll yeah, I, I always read anthologies by three named editors. Oh, ah, okay. So, John Joseph Adams uh, anthologies, I always read. Gordon, I also yeah, read right. uh, Gardner Joseph Dosois' <laughs> Best of the Year anthology, and John Joseph Hartwell. <laughs> and Catherine Joseph Hartwell, <laughs> with four names, and then they, they uh, I, used, I used to love the, um, uh, the the fantasy and horror anthologies from Boutros, Boutros, Dadlow. Oh. <laughs> um, do, you, do, you, do you have any thoughts? Well, I, I, I think you, you didn't mention Hal Duncan's story, which is about the, you know, the, 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 the ter you know, it's sort of like um, the terribly transgressive act of wearing linen and cotton together, and you know, uh, <laughs> how, the, how the punishments of the Old Testament dog eats out, and you know, the pagan character who, I know, is the favorite. That was kind of one of my favorites, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and I, and I'm, I'm surprised that you didn't mention the Le Guin story, The Fabric of Time. Because <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I mean, it's short, but it's, but it, you know, it, it gets to the point, and, and the way that she wove the, the characters' lives together was. Uh, well, and, Two things. One about Joel's story with everything being blue. I, I, that's a, just a clear example of art Im imitating light. So, <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite story in there was Marissa Lingen's story, Waiting for Godot, where she's watching a friend knitting a baby blanket and waiting for her adoption to come through. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a lovely story. Yeah, and there's you know a lot of real emotion in there. Yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I misread that as knitting for Godot, and, <laughs> <laughs> and it made no sense to me, but now. Right. Thank you. <laughs> right. Do any of you have any other thoughts, or maybe we can move on to Ben's story? Well, um, well okay. Book, sorry. Uh, yeah, no, I, I um, well, I just, I'm really excited about the new um, uh, Smolder Press reissue of the, of the classic. It's, it's a very little known in the English-speaking world, um, but it's, you know, the, the um, the, the small bear title is uh, the, the um, Prism of Dremta, which is which is pretty accurate translation. So the original is I, I don't know how many people know, but the original is um, Le Prisme de Quel on ne rêve pas, it was by um, Sebastian Melmoth, who is of course um, was what Oscar uh, Wilde renamed himself after he got out of jail. <laughs> so at the very end of his life, you know, after at, right after that, in a ballad of red and gold, um, he, is it gold? <laughs> Go jail? Jail. 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 jail? No, you say go. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, it was originally going to be a soccer story. Because there was a first draft before he got arrested. Anyway, but that. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, so, uh, but anyway, so after he wrote the Vatican Jail, he, he was working on this. You know, it was, it was very. Jail. It was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was. He started in Naples while he was living with, with you know Robert, his lover, when he got he reunited with him. Then he it, it ended just you know just before his death in Paris. It was you know and and um, it's uh, you know it's very uh, you know it, it, it's really it's early uh, you know it's proto cyberpunk. You could almost argue it, it, it you know it's it's and interestingly um, E.M. Forrester saw it in manuscript and the machine stops is actually a response <laughs> to Wilde's world and in a way I think well, of the two I think Wilde's is superior because it's this very well so you know he, he, he's very interested in, in the technology at the time and, and he um, so there, there and, and, and in social class and so on so in this in this you know it's kind of a, a dystopia uh, where you know they, they have um, they, you know the, the, the workers are all uh, hooked up where they have you know like um, cinematographs that they're watching and they have small gramophones attached to their ears and they're constantly being fed you know a string of entertainment to sort of anesthetize them and the you know the leisure classes are also wired into these into these things and um, you know and there's a uh, um, there's a um, uh, insurgent group of, of rebellious artists who you know are sort of um, want to subvert this and and uh, they, they you know to, to overthrow you know the radicals 
And they're sort of they sort of present to the surrealists. They're making these strange dream things. They try to see, you know, the, and they and they sort of hack into the system, as it were. Of course, it's really surprising. It's not what you expect of Oscar Wilde. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, in a way, it is because it's it, the, the social the farce, satire. The there's the farce, and, the farce right. and there and the fact that the, you know the artists cre create these sort of. Um, oh, actually, um, it, there's a some people think that Fritz Lang's Metropolis is actually based on the story, but <laughs> although he ruined it, he butchered it because well, he took Fritz out. Fritz Lang all was of the, sleeping with Oscar Wilde. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> although it was ten, but yeah. But, but, <laughs> Takes all the, you know, the, the evil industrial bureaucrat who, who sort of is the, is the, the patsy villain in, in Metropolis. And he had the good lines in Wilde's version. I mean, he was, you know, he was really almost, you know, the, the cynical hero. But these artists, you know, they, they make all these revolutionary things, and, and they, they, they fail because it's simply the more transgressive they are, the more popular it is, and the more, you know, the more entertained the. the, the it was sort of the Lady Gaga this time. It, he, he was the Lady Gaga this time. So um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, but this, you know, the, the other thing that's interesting about it is that there, this is actually the second English. Um, English language translation of it because I mean it's, it's well known in the French speaking yeah. science fiction world. But it's, you know, it, it, I think part of the problem is that we all heard about it in anticipation, right? Yeah. But but there was a translation in the in the that it came out in as an ace double in, in 1959, backed with marooned on Epsilon Seven, and it just kind of you know it didn't I think it was the wrong you know yeah. um, the wrong it was, it was too early and, and you know, people were slow and and uh, yeah but 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 um, I, you know, anyway, so I, I'm I'm excited that it's coming out now. It's a, it's a good it's a good translation. Right, right. And I read an alternate title in the in the Ace Double. Uh, well, I think when it, in the Ace Double it yeah. picked up the title that was used when a translation appeared in um, an early issue of Amazing Stories when they were uh -huh. lifting stuff and was then called Death Gods of the Pluto Sphere. Right. <laughs> and um, and the uh, the author was credited as being John Joseph Wilde. <laughs> We know that Hugo Gernsbach spoke no French, and so when he had to translate things, he just picked random words. <laughs> Figuring that nobody would know because French people are never going to read amazing. Well, yeah, he found a German translation. <laughs> Done by Fritz Lang. <laughs> when he was 10. When he was 10. No, he was 10. <laughs> the time spoke no English. Any 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 ten year old wearing a monocle always attracts attention. Little Fritz is probably going to go very far. <laughs> I want you to stand over there. No. I, right now, and I want you to look up at the big big furnace as if it is a giant god, the mammon. Yes. I think we now have the name for the color of the the lure. It's Dorian Gray. I think it's, um, uh, you know, I, I, th I think there's a, there's a shift in, there's a big shift in tone because it starts out very, it's, it's not clear what he is, I think it's to make ambiguity where he's going with it because it starts out very, um, you know, very, uh, um, uh, there's an element of, of, of uh, almost utopian, you know, so mm -hmm. Oscar Wilde thinks that in a way it would be, it would be quite fun to be sitting around watching movies all, all day. Um, you, know, I, I, it's, you know, it's kind of an absurd vision of, of uh, you know, an unrealistic notion that you know people in the future would spend all their time sitting in front of some kind of you know screen, screen and, and, right. you know, and, and, and while they were supposed to be doing work, entertaining themselves with movies that other people had made, you know, in some you know, I mean, you know, right, I, trading imaginary vegetables, trading, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, so that, <laughs> and that's you know, that's you know, it's a little bit straining credibility of uh, you know, right, right, right. You get a small sense of this in uh, the importance of being earnest. You know, with the cucumber sandwiches. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, well, they figure prominently in the, in the, uh, right. in the, in the uh, version. Yeah, it's a real prefiguring, really. Yeah. They're, but, like, they're direct sequels, really. Well, they're, they're, you know, it's no, no coincidence that it is Fall V that they play online. <laughs> yeah. Another bad translation from the French. <laughs> well, nobody has brought up what I thought was the real problem with the book, though, which was that the including was so heavy handed. It was like he was saying, and this is what they do in the future. And maybe that's just me reading back, you know, because I've gotten used to modern conventions of, you know, how we pick up on the fact that something is science fiction, but it just really didn't work well for me. Wild was not subtle. <laughs> Yeah, it really seemed like that. But one great thing about 
about reading this with an e-reader, though, and I did appreciate you getting us those PDFs, don't tell small beer, um, <laughs> is, um, is that you can annotate real heavily, which is great. You really feel like annotate, just like highlighting and sharing every single line of a book like this. Right. Yeah. But that explains the emails that I've been getting that just, just have wor one word. It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, flamboyant. <laughs> Okay then. <laughs> and so then I try to use it in a sentence everywhere I go that day. <laughs> Many people find, seem to find this annoying. <laughs> Paper or plastic? Flamboyant. <laughs> it's a lame. Right, you want a lame bag. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. So well, thank you very much for, for sharing your thoughts on that book.